Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from New Jersey Institute of Technology. This is Norka at Crossroads. It is our pleasure. She was with us on Capital Report last time, our other show. She's with us now, Evelyn Mahil. She is the executive director of a wonderful organization. It's called Winona's House Child Advocacy Center. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having me back. Uh, last time we talked a lot about public policy and things like that. Um, but for those who do not know what Winona's House is, describe it. Sure. Uh, Winona's House is the designated child advocacy center for Essex County. And we're located in Newark, New Jersey. However, we um, service all children that have been, well, at least most of the more severe cases of sexual abuse and physical abuse um, that are reported out into Essex County. But Evelyn, I was just thinking about this. I was getting ready for this show. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. we talk about Newark at a crossroads, the name mm -hmm. of the series. The children who are victims of violence, domestic violence, is it any different mm -hmm. in a city like Newark, given what families face versus a suburban, wealthier community? Is it any different or is what a child faces and they come to you just the same? I think that what we see with the kids in Newark is kind of sort of like a, just multi layers of issues, right? Um, a kid that is experiencing domestic violence in the home, that's witnessing domestic violence in the home, is probably also a child that's being victimized themselves, right? So they're probably victims of child abuse, uh, um, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Um, they're probably seeing um, violence in the community. They're probably also living in poverty stricken neighborhoods. Uh, that's a lot of layers. So that's what you see. You see a lot of complex layers. And so a child that, you, um, that comes in with an issue of domestic violence in their homes, you're not just dealing with the domestic violence in the home. You're not just dealing with you know, the relationship between the parents and the child. You're dealing with a lot of different things. Uh, what's going on in the community? What's their walk to school like in the mm. morning? What did they witness? What did they see? What did they hear from their peers? And when you talk about a community like Newark, where you, you know, we have a very high population, we see a lot of different things, a lot of different issues. Kids talk amongst themselves. They do. They, they tell each other stories. They tell what's going on in the homes. They, they tell each other what happened when they were walking to school. And so all of that becomes a part of what creates their character, right? All of that becomes a part of who they are and how they see the world. How and do you so, deal with, I mean, I don't want, I know it's a complex, you ask for a simple answer, I know there's not one. In dealing with that child <clears throat> at Winona's house, mm -hmm. Is it more complicated and multifaceted and multilayered to deal with and help that child in Newark? It is. Um, it is because of what, of what I just said. Um, kids that come to Winona's house are the kids that are severely sexually abused. And so we have the severely sexually abused, we have the kids that are severely physically abused. And when they come in, we're not just dealing with that. Right? We're dealing with the fact that that child is probably going to get um, placed out of their home. So when they get placed out of their home, they go and see, you know, they go into another home. And we see a lot of... Is that a foster home? A foster home, right? Because the state comes in and says... The state comes in and says... You cannot go back to where you were. We will be... We're in charge now. We're in charge. And, and not all the time. Um, if the perpetrator's in the home, if it happens to be a stepfather, biological parent, et cetera, will they get removed from the home? And in Newark, we have a shortage of foster care parents. Right? So these kids are getting removed. And when they get removed, they're getting removed because they've been traumatized. They've already experienced something. They've already been victimized. But that is the only place they know. That is the place that they call home. So when they're getting placed somewhere else, it's almost a re-victimization. It's almost another trauma. It's another layer. And you, and you really don't know where they're going to be placed. So that means it could be a new school setting. It could be a new community for them. It could be something as easy as moving a child from the North Ward to the South Ward, from the West Ward. Wards, for those who don't know, yes. one ward in Newark is uh, 22 square miles, and the North Ward mm -hmm. is where I grew up, and one end of the city in the South Ward exactly. is the other that, that butts up against, if you will. Um, other communities like Irvington and other places. So the point you're trying to make here is that just within the city... Just within the city, 
what you Those have. Those are two is, totally different communities. Absolutely. Two totally different communities. Different cultures, different everything. Different everything. What you have is these little subcultures that end up dividing people, right? And then it's just a whole new system for the children to have to learn, whether it be a school system, a neighborhood system, et cetera. That's in top of the trauma that they're already living. That's already in top of, you know, the victimization, already mm. in top of, like, being sexual abuse, being, you know, taken away from the parent, the biological parents or yeah. the settings, the siblings. You know, most of these kids are not just, you know, one child in the home. They have siblings. And when you take them apart and you put them in different homes, that's a, another layer of trauma. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, everyone, but I was just thinking about this. When, when, when the funding for your organization was mm -hmm. at risk a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and we did some programming about this on Capital Report, yes. and a lot of others jumped in and, and tried to understand what was happening, I thought to myself, so, <clears throat> my owner's house named after uh, the great Senator Winona Lippman, who uh, represented the city of Newark in the state Senate, um, a trailblazer, mm -hmm. yes. you know, which is not even doing justice to who and what she was, yes. the late uh, Senator Lippman, who fought for these children before Absolutely. anyone even talked about them. Absolutely. But that being said, I asked myself, if Winona's House or organizations like Winona's House were not there for mm -hmm. these children, well then, what would who, who would take them in? I, well. This is very interesting. I mean, traditionally, a child that's been victimized, right, you get a, you call NJ abuse, you, you report the case yeah, to, the to, the state right, state government. to the Department of Children and Families. That's right. That case, that child will go to the police department. Hopefully, they would get some type of medical and mental health treatment, not all the time. Maybe they get one, one, one type of treatment, maybe not another, maybe medical, maybe not, not the mental health, maybe not ongoing. And so places and agencies like Winona's House, uh, CACs, right, Child Advocacy Center, are so important and so crucial. Because what we're talking about, when you're talking about Newark at a crossroads, you're talking about the different types of issues that we continue to face in Newark, right, the different challenges that we continue to face in Newark, things like juvenile delinquency, things like, you know, poor academic performance, high school dropout rates, gang et cetera, violence. gang violence, right? But what you're talking about, it's not the problem itself. Most of these problems, what we call problems and challenges, they're just symptoms of the core issues that we have not addressed. I constantly keep saying, you know, if we look at the research, the research will tell you child abuse and neglect will often lead to juvenile delinquency. It will often lead to mental health issues. It will often lead to poor academic success. The challenges that we're talking about, that we continue to wrap our brains around and say, well, what is the strategy? How do we target this? How do we minimize? How do we um, drop the delinquency um, rate in, in the city of Newark? How do we you know, keep the kids involved? All of those things that we continue to wrap our heads around and try to find out you know, some solutions, we're missing the core Issues. Is. These kids have untreated trauma. They have been victimized early in childhood, and that trauma has not been treated, and therefore you're seeing a manifestation of that trauma one way or another, whether it be in the schools or in the streets when they're committing crimes or when they're becoming, you know, part of a gang because they're missing a family because that very core system is not there for them. Before I let you out here, why is this so personal for you? Why is this so personal for me? Uh, I've dedicated about 18 years um, of my life into this uh, field, but I also have my own personal history. And as a survivor, I think that I have both a professional um, and academic uh, background in it, but I have the insight of what it is to be traumatized early in childhood and what that can do for you. And mm -hmm. I've had you know, many blessings in my life, and I think that I am highly favored in that sense in terms of being here, but I don't think that many kids have that opportunity. I want kids to feel that they can have that opportunity, that because they've been traumatized, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is their destiny, that that somehow forms or shapes what they're going to become or they should become in the future. And I think that children need to know that. But in order for the kids to know that, there has to be an adult that tells them that. There has to be an adult that takes responsibility for our kids. There has to be an adult that says, you know, you can and you will, and I am going to give you access, opportunity, and I am going to allow you to succeed. And so that's what we need to do as leaders. We need to go back and we we need to tell our children they have hope. So I think that me going back and being able to do this work is very gratifying, both pro professionally and personally. And I think that more leaders and more people need to kind of sort of unite and understand that child abuse and neglect, it's, it's a very urgent issue. And we need to adhere to that. We need to respond to that. 
keep doing it, Evelyn. Thank you. And we'll keep having you on. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay right there. We'll continue from uh, the campus of NJIT at uh, Newark at a crossroads right after this. Thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by New Jersey Institute of Technology, Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, Barnabas Health, TD Bank, Josh S. Weston, The Fidelco Group, and by PSE&G. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.